Fasting has been prescribed on you, O Muslims, the same way it was prescribed on the nations before you, so that you may achieve taqwa. So the purpose of Ramadan, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly informs us in the Quran, is for the fasting believer to achieve taqwa. Taqwa means fear of Allah and obeying Allah's commandments and not disobeying Allah's commandments. So in Ramadan, when a person has food and drink and his wife in front of him, and yet he forces himself and controls himself from consuming these things that would otherwise be lawful in the months other than Ramadan, then he is teaching himself how to stop himself from committing sins. So when Allah tells you don't go to an interest-based loan, and your nafs tells you, no, I really want that car, I really want that house, then through Ramadan, if you have had enough exercise in that Ramadan, you will be able to stop yourself from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and getting this interest-based loan. As an example, if there is another temptation to you in the form of women or haram money or other, ter or other terms of, or other uh, kinds of haram things that shaitan is going to bring your way, then you are going to be strong enough because you have had enough practice. Just like a person that goes to a lift waiting station or a club so that he can exercise, so they can have enough power to be able to run for a long period of time. In Ramadan, we get an exercise for the rest of the year so that we are able to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stop ourselves from committing sins. Therefore, a person, when he gains some good habits in Ramadan, such as not eating so much, such as staying up at night for prayer, such as not missing the prayer in congregation, especially the Fajr prayer and the Isha prayer, then he should keep on this momentum throughout the year and keep these good habits throughout the year so that his taqwa is always up, his battery, his faith battery is always charged and he is able to 
continue the next 11 months with enough taqwa and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he reaches Ramadan again and renews his faith and so on and so forth. So taqwa is the purpose from this month. This month is almost over. If anyone has not achieved that yet, he still has a few days to do that. There is always hope as long as Ramadan is not outside, it has not left us. Now, after Ramadan finishes, there is the Eid. There is the Feast of the Muslims. One of two allowed Feasts of the Muslims. We have only two Eids in this religion. We have Eid al-Fitr, the one that comes after Ramadan, and Eid al-Adha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed these two Eids for Muslims, not nothing else, only these two Eids. And as you see, this is an emulation of the lamp for Muslims. Eid al-Fitr, before you can enjoy in this Eid and wear nice clothing and be happy, you have to have some hardship for a month. Then you're going to be happy. Similarly, for Eid al-Adha, you're going to have hardship of Hajj if you go to make Hajj before going to Eid al-Adha. Or if you're not in Hajj, then you're going to fast those nine days before the Eid. Similarly, a Muslim is only going to be happy and enter Jannah because in this world, he's going to have enough hardship. So this is the message that the Muslims are given. This is why the Muslims are trained. So a Muslim has enough happiness at the end of a certain hardship. Surely with hardship comes ease. As opposed to someone living an easy life and then having hardship for the rest of eternity because there is no death in the hereafter. In the hereafter, people of Jannah will remain in Jannah forever. People of Hellfire will remain in Hellfire forever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us instructions in this world. They may seem a little bit difficult for us compared to everyone else who is not a Muslim. But believe me, it is for our own good. And it is only for us to be able to deserve Jannah. Okay, to deserve Jannah. So a person should not despair, should not think that this religion is a difficult religion. No, it's only a test. So that after the test, you come out stronger. And you deserve the true blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you get Jannah. Now at the end of this month, there is Eid. And in this Eid, there is a, the prayer for the Eid, Salat al-Eid. Now before we go to prayer, the most important thing that we have to do is we have to give out Zakat al-Fitr. Zakat al-Fitr is a charity that a Muslim has to pay on each member of his family, whether fasting or not. So if you are a family of six, for example, father, mother, and four kids, mashallah, that's six people that you need to pay Zakat al-Fitr on. If you are uh, responsible for your parents, for their nafaqa that you spend on your parents, you also have to give zakat al-fitr on them. So you give zakat al-fitr on yourself and on everyone else there is and the you. Zakat al-fitr, it's a small thing. Zakat al-fitr, basically the, the, uh, the way it's measured is a sa. Sa in Arabic means four mudud. Mud, mud is this. This is a mud. So four of these things, you can scoop rice or wheat or or dates. Okay, four of these. Four of these, this is how much you need to give Zakat al Fitr. Now the scholars have tried to estimate roughly how much that is. It's between two point one kilograms to three kilograms. So if a person gives three kilograms, he is on the safe side per person. Okay? For example, if uh, if we are for example in as an example in, in Pakistan, the most common food there is rice. Okay? So it's better to give this zakat al-fitr in a form of rice because that is the food of the people. If you are in this other countries, for example, Morocco, that eat bread, it's better to give wheat or flour to make bread from as zakat al-fitr. So it is recommended to give the type of food that the people of the land use. Now, can you give this as a form of money? Yes or no? What does that mean, yes or no? You cannot give money to a person telling him, you are a poor person, this is your zakat al-fitr. You cannot do that, okay? It's, it's different from the sunnah. But what you can do is you can make either an organization or a masjid or a person responsible to take care of that. So you give him the money and he gets, he takes charge of buying rice or flour or dates and then give it to the poor people. It's better to give it to the poor people in your community. If you know there are poor people. But if you know that you're going to give them rice and they're going to throw it away, you're going to give them dates, throw it away and not use it, then it's better to not give them. It's better to give this money uh, to a person who is overseas in a country where there, there are visible poor people. And then he can take charge of buying these things and giving, giving this on your behalf. 
And this has to come up before the prayer of Eid. Because the Prophet ﷺ narrated that if you give up this zakat al-fitr before the prayer, it is considered zakat al-fitr. If you give this after the Eid prayer, it's only a normal charity. It's not zakat al-fitr. Now, when does this zakat al-fitr, uh, when are we allowed to give it to the poor people? Usually, it's when you know it's Eid. So, for example, after the Maghrib of the 29th day of Ramadan, if Ramadan has only 29 days, or after the Maghrib of the 30th day of Ramadan, if Ramadan has 30 days. That's the usual time to give out that, that zakat al-fit, that charity. So from Maghrib all the way to Salat al-Aid. However, there is a concession in Islam, the companions did actually take out this money two or three days before the Eid prayer, so that it's easy for people. So for example, the night of the 28th of Ramadan, you are able to give uh, at that time. But you, you should not give it to the poor person in the beginning of Ramadan, okay? So the, the usual time, for Zakat al-Fitr to be given up is after the Maghrib of the last day of Ramadan. That means after you break the fast on the 29th day, and then you see the, the moon, that means tomorrow is Eid, or if you fast 30 days after you break the fast on the 30th day, then you give out the charity to the poor people in the form, as we said, of dates or rice or flour or something like that. There is a concession, as we said, you can take out the Zakat al-Fitr a couple of days before the Eid. Okay. And we said that it's usually about three kilograms, roughly, of flour. Uh, you see, for example, if you're gonna have someone do that on your behalf, that person is gonna estimate how much it costs to buy a kilo of whatever he's gonna give up, and then he's gonna do the equivalent in in the ter in terms of Canadian dollars. Uh, this year, some some uh, you know some organizations they estimate that as eight dollars, others at I think five dollars. But of course, if you're gonna do this in, a, in a, some third world country, it's gonna be much less than that. So because obviously, you know, for one person, person may not feel the hit of it. But if a person has, mashallah, 10 people in his family and he does not have a lot of money, then maybe he's gonna feel that it's, that it's a little bit burdensome on him. But you know, when I did the calculation in a country such as Morocco, for example, it comes out two and a half dollars a person. So that's nothing, two and a half dollars a person. Alhamdulillah, that's something that most of us can afford. So we said that you can either choose a poor person in your community that you know he's gonna use these things, rice or dates or flour, it's better to give it to that person. If you know that the poor, pe poor people around you will not use this and they will look down on it or throw it away or sell it with half price, then it's better to try to find someone overseas where there are more visible Muslim poor people and you give him the money and then he can pay on your behalf. If, for example, you don't have a means to send the money to him, you can tell him, pay from your pocket, and this is debt on me. You can do that. But that becomes debt on you. When you see the person, you have to give him that money. Okay? So all these are things in the Sharia that make it very easy for us to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to achieve taqwa. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds in this blessed month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our sins, to forgive all of our shortcomings that we did in this Ramadan, and to enable us to be among the people on whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown mercy and forgiven for their sins and has uh, saved from the hellfire. Because as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves a number of people in this month from hellfire. He decrees that these people would not be among the people of hellfire. We ask Allah that we are among them. أقول قول هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إن هو الغفور الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شر أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله So Ramadan is almost over We have to give out zakat al-fitr before the salat of the Eid Now also for the Eid salat there are some etiquettes that a person uh, should undergo as an emulation of the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, before going to the Eid prayer because Islam alhamdulillah is a religion of discipline. Islam disciplines us in every step of the way in our daily lives so that we are 
uh, the best of mankind. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he sent us Muhammad salam, for the purpose of a tazkiyah. He said, Kiko, purify you so that we are the best of mankind. Calling people to the true religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are messengers of the messenger. We are messengers of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu And we can only call people into this beautiful religion if we emulate that beauty in ourselves. When people see us, the way we talk, the way we walk, the way we deal with people, then they're going to love our religion. They're going to want to be part of this beautiful establishment, which is the religion of Islam. So the first thing a Muslim should do on the, the, the day of Eid, the day of Eid is to take a bath, a ghusl. Okay, to take a bath. It is from the sunnah to take a bath on, uh, on the day of the Eid. It's narrated in Muwatta Imam Malik and elsewhere that Abdullah ibn Umar used to do ghusl on the day of Fitr before going up to prayer to the prayer place in the morning. Okay? The An Nawawi rahimahullah said that the Muslims were unanimously agreed that it is mustahab to the ghusl for Eid prayer. It is, it's not mandatory, but it is recommended. Okay? The reason why it is recommended is the same reason for doing ghusl on Friday. So that a Muslim always looks his best, smells his best, and feels his best. Okay? This is why Muslims should always be clean. He would feel good and people would like to be around him. Number two, so we said number one is ghusl. Number two, eating before going out of prayer. Eating, something before going out of prayer. The sunnah is to eat some dates in an odd number of dates. One date, three, five, seven, nine, etc. Before going out to the eighth prayer. Why? This is more of a show that it is prohibited to fast on that day. It's prohibited to fast on the day of the Eid. That's why from the Sunnah, it's to break the fast before going to the Eid prayer. As opposed to the other Eid, which is Eid al-Adha, the opposite is true. The Sunnah in Eid al-Adha is for the person to go to the prayer, slaughter his sheep, and the first thing he would break his fast on that day is from his sheep. It is the Sunnah on the Eid al-Adha. But Eid al-Fitr, the Sunnah is to break your fast before going out to the Eid prayer. Also, one of the uh, uh, sunnah that has been forgiven is takbir. Takbir starts when the sun sets on the last day of Ramadan. If Ramadan is 29 days after sunset, people would need to say takbir all the way until they go to the musallah and when the imam comes in to give the khutbah, that's when they stop saying the takbir. So from the sunset of the last day of Ramadan until the imam for the Eid khutbah shows up, a Muslim is supposed to say takbir. Not say it in unison, in one voice we are not a symphony here but everyone worships Allah individually everyone says takbir by himself there are different ways to say takbir Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar La ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Walillahi alhamd this is the form of takbir because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say, say in the Quran وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ This is in the Qur'an that we have to say takbir. But this is one of the sunnah that Muslims have, have, get, have, have abandoned. Not only that, but when a Muslim tries to establish this sunnah, people look at him like he's a crazy guy. Why is this guy saying takbir out loud by himself in the street? Is it crazy? No, it's not crazy. It's actually showing, showing the true religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has a big impact on your surrounding that we cannot fathom. So number three is saying takbir from the sunset of the last day of, of Ramadan until the Imam comes up to give you the Eid prayer. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said in Surah Al-Baqarah, that means 29 days or 30 days of Ramadan. That means you say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, for having guided you so that me be grateful to him. Because to be a Muslim, number one, and number two, to be a practicing Muslim, is a bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot thank Allah enough for being Muslims and for enabling us to be among those Muslims that actually pray and obey Allah. Number four, number four is offering congratulations at the end of the Salah. At the end of Eid Salah, it's recommended that the Muslims, even if you don't know it, because we are brothers, we are brothers hug each other, say normal greeting. There is nothing specific to say. Taqabbalallah, Eid Mubarak Sa'id, may Allah accept our deeds. All these things can be said during this situation. So after the Eid prayer, we, we hug each other, we, we, we smile in the face of each other, we try to show that we are happy in front of Allah, and we say congratulations, or Eid Mubarak Sa'id, or Taqabbalallah, may Allah accept 
our, our good deeds. Number five is adorning oneself on the occasion of Eid. Wearing your best. Wear your best clothing on Eid. It's narrated that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anh, said that Umar took a brocade cloak that was for sale in the market and brought it to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, buy this and adorn yourself with it for the Eid and for receiving the delegations. So Umar radiallahu anh, basically gave this thing as a gift to the Prophet so that he can adorn himself in the Eid. Number six is going out to the Eid Musalla from one way, from your house to the Musalla, you take, for example, Dixon, Kiplin, wherever you go, on the way back, you take a different way. You go Islington, something like that. The scholars say this is more of a show of the numbers of the Muslims because when people they see different faces going back and forth they're gonna believe that there are a large number of Muslims there this is the first reason the scholars have stated second reason is that the angels and the roads will witness for you that you have walked on them to go to offer the prayer and come back from prayer because the earth when you do a good deed on top of it will witness for you when you do an evil deed on top of it will witness against you on a day of judgment Okay? So this is one of the purposes of the sunnah. So we said, number one, do ghusl. We said there are six sunnahs that a person should do in Eid. Number one, do ghusl. Number two, break his fast before going. Eat an odd number of dates or anything. Tea or whatever you may choose, but dates is more correct sunnah. Number three, we said is... Number three is... Uh, takbir. Takbir, which is very important from the sunset, is takbir. Number four, offering congratulations to one another after the, the eight khutbah. Uh, number five, wearing the best clothing. And number six is going to the musalla from one way and coming back from another way. It's also the sunnah to pray the eight prayer in the musalla, not in the masajid. It's the sunnah to pray eight prayer in the musalla. It's a place that, that's not a masjid. So, you know, obviously, or, you know, Situation of places like Canada, people can rent like uh, halls or, or something like that. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to emulate the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help our brothers and sisters throughout the world and to save them from all evil, save them from the fitna, uh, to uh, give money to the poor among them, to give help to the sick among them, to have mercy on the souls of the Muslims that have died before us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us steadfast on the path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a good ending in our lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people that spread this true religion and call people to this religion and enable us to be a, a means for people to benefit from this beautiful religion. أقول قولي هذا وسفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفرنا والغفور الرحيم وقوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله